Good afternoon and welcome to the Lunchtime Learning Webcast with the uh, Instructional Materials Coordinators Association of Texas. I'm Kat. I'm Tony Black. I'm the current president-elect of the organization and we want to welcome you to the webcast this afternoon. Today we're going to be talking with I'm Kat's legis legislative counsel Colby Nichols of the Austin law firm Powell and Leon uh, about where we stand uh, with the 85th legislature and where they are at this point. Uh, first, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Follette, for supporting our webcast today and making it possible to offer the webcast uh, free to those of you who are um, with us today. I know you may have a lot of questions about the legislative process today. Today's webcast is going to give you the opportunity to ask questions, and so we want to give you the rundown of how you can do that. So today, you can call in, uh, you can fax in, yeah, we're still using fax, text in or email in your questions at any time during today's broadcast. So you have uh, that information there on the screen uh, for you. So if you can, if you have your phone handy and you have a question that comes up during the course of Colby's presentation today, uh, then feel free to text those in and we'll get to those uh, as quickly as we can uh, during the course of the broadcast. So 512-567-0857 is the number to text your questions to. The email today is textbook at texas.net and then there's a phone number there 512-251-8101 if you want to talk to a live individual and then you can fax that in uh, if you have your fax uh, machine handy right there with you maybe in the car with you as you're driving 512-251-8152 uh, so we've got all the bases covered for you to get those questions in uh, if you have those as we go through. So welcome Colby. Today we want to thank you for uh, coming down, taking the long trip from Austin yeah. uh, to make it in today and visit with us. So Colby, a lot of people are saying that it's been a fairly unusual legislative session and so we just want to know if, if from your perspective do you agree with that and kind of walk us through this legislative session and, and some of the high points. Absolutely. Um, it, it definitely has been a very strange uh, session. Um, you know, we, we last session left off on the note of it wasn't Republicans versus Democrats, it was House versus Senate. Um, I would say that that attitude has ramped up significantly. Um, war of words here recently between the Speaker and Lieutenant Governor I think demonstrates that, the sort of negotiation through the media. Um, and throughout my presentation I'll talk a little bit more about that dynamic. Um, but definitely is a, a very different uh, session. Uh, Representative Anchia just this morning was asked almost that exact question uh, and he said that he thinks it is the worst session in modern history uh, and that wow. it rivals the 2011 session where we had the big cuts yeah. obviously. Um, granted we don't have the big cuts but there's not a whole lot of legislation going through. Um, and it has not been the most friendly session for public education. We want to move on to the presentation? Let's move right along okay. and, uh, and get to uh, what you've got for us. All right. So I'm going to go over briefly um, some of the uh, updates from the legislature. Um, I want to start out by talking about sort of some of the stuff that has been happening um, in the House, which may cause us to go into a special session. This is a a uh, clip from an article by Ross Ramsey. It says the Texas House is like a fourth grader who doesn't remember big homework assignments until Sunday night. The kid piddles all weekend and then throws together a baking soda volcano in time for first period science on Monday. Uh, I've made this argument for for many years. Uh, you know, it's 140 days, but we only work for about 80 of them. It mm -hmm. seems like. Um, you know, we don't get any work done until committees are named and they're typically not named until mid to late February. So uh, we waste pretty much an entire month uh, just waiting on committees to be named. And so part of what you've seen is uh, some delay tactics here at the end of session and um, that has caused some of the major pieces of legislation um, to, to stall. Uh, like the sunset bill um, mm -hmm. that was a victim of the uh, Mother's Day massacre as they call it. A um, hundred bills died that that night and that day. Uh, so I, I think looking forward we need to think about um, less about what we got this ses session and more about what we were able to keep out. 
um, because that's kind of been the message of the session. Um, moving on over, I, as I said, here's some, some numbers for you um, and why this is an unusual session. Last session we had a record low number of bills um, uh, percentage-wise that passed. Uh, this session, as of May 11th, um, there were 77 bills passed uh, through both chambers, so headed to the governor. Um, at the same time last session, 129 bills. Wow. Uh, so that's a pretty significant drop off. Um, and again, it goes back to that House versus Senate dynamic. Uh, that's been probably the biggest uh, issue. Uh, Lieutenant Governor wants the House to pass bathrooms. Um, and the House wants the Lieutenant Governor to uh, look at the school finance bill and, and pass that. So we're kind of stuck. Um, everybody has their own pet projects that they want to have happen and uh, unfortunately a lot of bills are dying, good bills, local bills even, uh, are dying in the process. Um, the Freedom Caucus is a, a group of about 10 representatives um, that sort of uh, are on the far right uh, that really took control of the process the other night and uh, delayed that sunset bill which may okay. and, and I do think it will cause a special session probably um, and so uh, in addition to some other things right. and so and that picture is of Jonathan Sticklin um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, I think, again, Representative Anchia said, had a great quote. He said, you know, last session um, the Freedom Caucus mm -hmm. couldn't pass gas. In this session they are running the show. And, wow. and they've really, uh, strategy-wise, uh, done very well this session, mm -hmm. um, much to the chagrin of, you know, uh, the Strauss-type Republicans. Yeah. So, um, that dynamic is is going to remain. They can't get anything passed, so their op their opportunities mostly deal with killing bills, um, and so that's been part of the the logjam as well. And I think it's important to mention that when you go ahead and say that special session is looming, that then that impacts our IMCAT folks with the fact that those of you, several of you, have sent in some questions, basically uh, or very specifically asking the question about when are we going to know. Uh, what money we're going to have available in, I, in our IMA fund, in EMAP, to be able to begin purchasing. Well, with the special session looming there, you're, you're going to just need to brace yourself for a delay there. I think that's correct. Abs yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that um, what everyone needs to remember is that there is uh, no real uh, incentive for the lieutenant governor to pass the budget. Uh, if he's wanting bathrooms, if he's wanting Senate Bill 2, which is the, the rollback tax rates for cities and counties, um, the budget bill is the only bill in the session that has to pass, um, absolutely has to. Uh, the sunset bill needs to pass, otherwise there's several agencies um, that will uh, basically be, be done away with. And, and so what we're looking for and what I expect to have happen is for Lieutenant Governor to hold up the budget um, so that he can get those other things placed on a special session. Um, and politically, I don't know how Governor Abbott doesn't add those things to the call um, because there really is no winning situation for him not to other than the fact to stand up to Patrick, but um, I, I don't think that's something that's probably likely. I think if we do have a special, we'll have Senate Bill 6, which is the bathroom bill. I think we'll have vouchers. I think we'll have Senate Bill 2. And I think we'll have the budget. So um, none of those things are mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. you know, obviously. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I don't look for anything major to happen in school finance. Um, as we m already know, we, we've been cut uh, on the IMA side, $125 million in the House, $104 million in the Senate. And so, uh, you know, that, that presents two problems, obviously. Uh, the first problem being that uh, that money is probably not staying in education. Right. Um, they'll uh, supplement GR and replace that and play their little shell game that they play. Um, the other problem with that is that the state board will more than likely 
not have an incentive to raise the distribution rate if they know that the Texas legislature is going to take their cut off the top. Um, and so that's something that we've presented to legislators. Uh, you know, a lot of it's fallen on deaf ears. Um, they need somewhere to cut, and the IMA had ample amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, everyone's still going to get more money than we got last session. Right. Right. Uh, but the precedent that's being set right now is really dangerous for um, uh, you guys as coordinators. Let's talk a little bit about school finance. Um, House Bill 21 was the big school finance bill. Uh, it would have increased the basic allotment 5140 to 5350. Um, it would have changed transportation to even where chapter 41s could get it. Uh, it also had uh, a new weight for dyslexia students. It changed the weight for the bilingual allotment. Um, and probably the most controversial thing is it repealed a hold harmless for school district um, as identified uh, in 1993 as chapter 41s. And so some of these sort of more wealthy districts obviously were upset with that provision. Mm. Um, this, this bill uh, made it to the Senate. The Senate uh, consequently placed a uh, education savings account um, uh, bill into House Bill 21. Uh, it was a really interesting moment being in that room at that time. While we could have guessed that that was going to happen, we weren't necessarily sure. Uh, and so when it did happen, it was, it was a really powerful moment, actually, to see all of the education community stand up, because we had all put cards in support of that bill, stand up and go to the desk and change our cards from support to opposition. Um, and the line wrapped around the room. So, and the senators, of course, that were in favor of it were glaring at us. And mm -hmm. uh, so that wasn't fun, but, uh, you know, I think at that moment the message from the education community was, is, you know, this isn't about money. Right. This is about uh, what we do for kids. Yep. And we feel like um, kids need to be protected in this situation, even if it means that we lose out on $1.8 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is the way the system should be. Yep. So. so more than likely, um, House Bill 21 is is probably not going to make it. Uh, we're at a we're at a stalemate, an impasse. Uh, this is just a real short all funds comparison between the Senate and the House budgets. You'll see there at the bottom um, they're not that far off in terms of money. Um, the real issue here that they're struggling with is the method of finance. Meaning, uh, the Senate is saying, let's take money from delayed payments um, that we would typically make just sort of an accounting trick, right? Uh, and then uh, the House is saying, well, let's dip into our $10 billion rainy day fund uh, by about $2.5 billion uh, to go ahead and fund some of those things that otherwise would take a cut, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's really the issue. It's not necessarily how much money, it's how they get to it. Um, and so that may be what ultimately keeps the budget from passing this session. Um, School finance going over to Senate Bill 2145. Uh, this is the Equity Center bill. This was a bill by uh, Chairman Taylor. Um, I had a lot of small schools interested in a small school allotment, which is essentially, you know, if you get, if you're less than 300 square miles, you're considered uh, small by choice, mm -hmm. uh, in which case you take a hit on your funding. Um, the bill would have repealed that, and so a lot of people thought that was real positive, but it also repealed everything else. Um, the idea behind the bill was that there's no more Band-Aids. Uh, and it was very interesting to hear the debates uh, on these bills uh, because the Senate didn't want to do any uh, what we call runs, which are you know cost overruns pretty much, right. uh, to show what each district would get because that's when we all turn against each other. Um, they didn't want to do that. So it was sort of, we're going to have a bill and we, not, we don't know what it'll do, but you know, we're not going to do runs. So it, it, was a, it was a real quandary, and it, the bill wasn't going to go anywhere probably. Um, and like I said, uh, 21 is, is sitting there, but they have the carrot in 21 of $1.8 billion. Um, and so that's why they inserted ESAs. And speaking of ESAs, um, vouchers, I know the uh, organization um, has talked about, you know, their interest in this issue, obviously, because it affects everybody. I think vouchers are likely dead. Um, 
in the House, uh, uh, Representative Van Dever, um, who we had at our conference just, what, two years ago, mm -hmm. um, laid out an amendment with Abel Herrero out of the Corpus area um, that basically said no public funds would be used for ESAs, tax credits, vouchers, basically any sort of uh, public funds going to private entities gotcha. when it comes to public education. Uh, and the House overwhelmingly supported that amendment. Uh, I think there may have been uh, 34, 35 uh, nays out of 150 members. So um, it, was, it was pretty overwhelming support and that's why I think it's going to be silly if um, the governor does add vouchers to the call because I, I think the House will, will soundly reject them again. Uh, moving on, Senate Bill 7. This one doesn't pertain too much uh, to you all, but this has to do with inappropriate relationships. Uh, this has been a really heavy news item. Something was going to happen. Um, this bill did pass. I do expect the, uh, the governor to sign it. It started out a lot worse. Um, uh, you know, one of the benefits of me practicing school law is that I was able to get into the offices and explain the practical implications of what was happening uh, with these bills, how I would advise clients. And so we were able to make some changes, um, but on the amendments, there was a few, uh, probably 14, 15 amendments, but I, I chose three to kind of highlight. Um, the school district will now have to provide uh, employees or not employees, excuse me, the student's parents that's involved in one of these incidents. Um, but most of all, uh, educators that are convicted of these type uh, issues, including uh, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, they can lose their TRS retirement benefit wow. because of it. So that, that was a, a, a pretty big um, uh, contentious issue, obviously, with the teacher groups, and, uh, but it did, in fact, pass. And I'm going to skip past um, that last slide, but here's uh, uh, House Bill 22. This is the proposed changes uh, from the House side uh, to accountability. Um, the, the House bill was a bill that uh, was put together by stakeholders, HD Chambers, the superintendent of ALEF ISD, the commissioner, uh, TEA staff all work together, TASA, um, they all work together to, to come up with mutually beneficial language. Uh, there was no way we were going to repeal A through F. We knew that going in, um, but it was obvious that something needed to change with, when the initial ratings came out. Uh, the issue is the Senate has subbed their own bill into House Bill 22, uh, and it's not as desirable from the educator standpoint. Uh, I, I don't know if House Bill 22 is going to move. Uh, we may rock along with this current rating system, which almost operates on a bell curve. Um, and so that, that's obviously an issue for a lot of districts, especially districts that have um, high socioeconomically disadvantaged kids. Uh, but the bill would have been great. It would have gone from four domains to three. Uh, it would have focused less on the, the standardized test. And even when it did focus on the test, it would fo focus more on growth. Mm -hmm. um, value added. Yeah, and so, you know, obviously that, that, that piece, if, you can't always control where kids are at when they come into your school, um, but what you can control is, is how much they grow when you get there. Um, and the commissioner could have looked at, you know, the, the socioeconomic status um, and raised the grade uh, one level under that bill. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have that authority right now. Um, so we're hoping that that's going to that's going to move forward, but I, I have my doubts. Just like everything else this session, it's, it's being held up, right? Mm -hmm. um, moving on through accountability, those of you that, um, you know, had students that participated in individual graduation committees right. um, where they can fail two of the state mandated exams and move forward, uh, that's been heard in mm -hmm. the, the House, and so it should be headed to the floor soon. I do think it'll pass. It's not a blanket okay, we're going to have this in perpetuity, but it does extend it to 2019. Um, House Bill 1500 uh, basically gives a one-up to districts that have programs that allow students to earn an associate's degree. They'll get some points on that on Domain 4. House Bill 515, uh, this would have extended the writing pilot, uh, but most importantly for our purposes, 
Um, it would replace the U.S. History end of course exam uh, and add an English to exam uh, in a civics test. Uh, and you'll see there in parentheses I have House Bill 1776, which by far is the best bill number reservation I've ever seen <laughs> um, because that bill did exactly that. It replaced um, the U.S. History exam with the citizenship test. Uh, and so we're, I don't think those bills are going to go anywhere. The Senate seemed to, to really uh, reject the idea of, of replacing that test, but um, it's, it's definitely out there. And, and then finally, um, under the bill, uh, there would be no more STAR retesting uh, for fifth and eighth grade uh, students, uh, which is matching up with federal requirements. Uh, that bill has been left pending, so we'll see what happens. Um, hopefully the committee will act soon. If they don't, uh, if they don't act by Saturday, we're probably not going to have that bill come out. Okay. Um, Saturday is a key deadline. Okay. Let's move on over to instructional materials specifically. I, I've only got three bills on here. We've talked about the budget. Um, that's the big one. Uh, but these three bills have direct impacts on the policy decisions we make as an organization going forward. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about them in the past. Right. Um, a couple of them sound really good in theory. Uh, the issue is when you, when you boil it down to um, you know, what it, how it's going to work practically, it, it's a problem. Um, and no, none more so than the technology lending grant which again, uh, Tony, you are a, a tech guy. Right. And so um, that sounds great that you were gonna get money <clears throat> for technology. The problem is, is it's money that you were already gonna get. Correct. And now they're saying you have to apply with the agency to get it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would have completely advised the organization to support that bill if it was new money and not money that was taken out of the IMA. Um, changing the name, um, we, we were neutral on that bill. It changes it from uh, the instructional materials allotment to the instructional materials and technology allotment, right. which is for all practical purposes, we understand that's what it is. Right. Um, and so what we decided was to stay off of it, but it's going to make it very difficult for us to make an argument in the future um, that we need a separate technology allotment if we change the name to. The, I, the IMTA, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we need another acronym. Yeah, another acronym. We may have to change our uh, our deal. Um, <laughs> so, state adopted open education resources. Uh, we opposed this bill in the Senate. We left it alone in the House. Uh, but I have to tell you, I have some real reservations with this because um, the chairman of the Senate Ed Committee is the one that offered the bill, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I had a group come up to me that was advocating for the bill afterwards and they were like, how could you possibly be against this? Um, and it's because I was there earlier in the session when the chairman said that all we need to give kids is an iPad and have access to open education resources. That's why we can cut $104 million out of the IMA. Um, we all know that open education resources are fantastic. Mm -hmm but we also know that they're supplementary. Um, and I think the state, if this bill is passed, uh, would, meet, would move more towards, uh, in the future, cutting more of the funding, because mm -hmm. we, you know, again, we don't, we don't need it apparently. Exactly. Um, and it would degrade our foundational curriculum materials. So um, that's the real big issue with that. Um, and this is really for, for one vendor Mm -hmm. um, in particular, uh, and while again, I think there's some redeeming qualities there, it's just not uh, necessarily the direction I think the organization probably wants to go. Right. Um, let's talk about something that uh, everyone I think has got in the back of their mind, right? Um, TRS, uh, the retirement side is fine. Um, you know, we have one of the strongest retirement funds in the nation. Uh, what is not fine is the retiree health care as well as those uh, districts that are forced to use TRS active care. Um, there doesn't look like there's going to be any reprieve um, for the active care participants. Uh, your premiums are going to continue to go up. Um, you know, the thing with active care is it'll never be insolvent. It's a self-funded plan. So um, in order to make that happen, premiums go up. And uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of people um, that are going to be, you know, uh, really struggling 
on the healthcare side, active employees. Um, as far as retired employees, and obviously, if you're listening to this webcast, you probably don't fit in that category, right? Um, but if you did, and for the future, um, they're likely going to see a result in their premiums. Um, how they fund that uh, increase that Chairman Ashby's bill is trying to accomplish is, is going to be interesting. Uh, again, the Senate and the House are debating the, the method of finance um, altogether. Should we dip in the rainy day fund to do this or not? And I, I think, you know, Tony, this is sort of um, the epitome of uh, what this se session has been about. Um, we have $10 billion sitting in a rainy day fund. Right. And we have retirees that, you know, in the 50s were making $12,000, $18,000 a year. That's their retirement annuity. Yeah. Um, and now we're saying we can't give you a billion dollars to fix TRS care, even though we have $10 billion sitting in the bank. Um, and I think, I think retirees, uh, like I said, those folks that, were, that are on that fixed income, it's going to be very, very difficult um, for them to continue to get quality health care. Um, and so I think at some point, uh, and I will say this too, it'll affect your school districts too because the bill has the um, uh, factor going up from the active payroll, which the school district has to pay, 0.55 to 0.75. Um, so that's going to be a f in your budgets. Um, that's going to be quite the hit, probably, yeah. Yeah. more than likely. And uh, the next slide is, is very simply um, sort of a one pager uh, prior to the Senate's changes. I'm not going to go over it, um, but if you if you're interested, you can certainly look at that. Uh, going to bonds, um, this doesn't affect a lot of people. If you're on the technology side, there was a bill that that would have basically disallowed you from going out for a bond and purchasing buses and technology because of the useful life issue. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, that bill uh, did not make it, uh, but it was out there and something that we've been paying attention to. And I, I'm not going to go through all these bills, but um, Pat and Leon, the firm, we had several bills um, that we put forth for, for different clients. And this is a list of those bills. Uh, that top one passed on second reading yesterday, so today it should be headed to the governor uh, after it passes. Um, the second one, House Bill 1569 by uh, Chairman Ashby, uh, looks like it's going to also uh, pass the Senate soon, so it'll be headed to the governor. Um, and the last one uh, is maybe the most uh, interesting, and it's an exemption for school buses on tollways. Uh, and it's something that um, Austin ISD brought to us uh, and fortunately we were able to get an amendment tacked onto the Transportation Sunset Bill uh, that would allow that to happen and, it, and we may get it to stick. So um, that would be very good for some of these districts in, yeah. in urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, last but not least, uh, we have some serious work going on down at the Capitol. Uh, this was on the day of the, the, the initial start of the Mother's Day Massacre. Um, and so that's uh, Representative Travis Clardy and Representative Stickland. Um, I have never seen the environment at the Capitol the way it is right now. Um, it is the most partisan um, environment that I've ever been a part of. Uh, you can see it in the representatives and senators' faces when they talk to each other. You can see the tension. You can see the frustration, um, and so that's sort of we've you know um, some on the the Tea Party side rail on Washington politics, but we're really bringing Washington to Texas right now, um, partly because of the Tea Party, right? So uh, that those sort of stalling tactics and those issues um, continue to to plague the legislative process. Well, that's unfortunate. Yes. The adults that we've sent to uh, <clears throat> help us out. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> a couple of reminders. First thing I want to do is, is give you the phone numbers again. If you do have a question uh, uh, to send in for Colby, uh, real quick, uh, you can text that question at 512-567-0857, and you can see there on your screen uh, places to email that, uh, phone, or fax as well. So if you do have a question uh, that's come out of the discussion today, we certainly want you to ask that while. Uh, we have him available. A couple of reminders that I want to give you um, <clears throat> as well. 
We just want to remind you that IMCAT Summer Institutes are going to be coming up and they're going to offer you a chance to get up-to-date information on instructional material processes and you can get this one-day training close to home. We're offering 11 different locations around the state uh, this summer, so please go to imcat.org, our website, and uh, look at the events section there and find the registration uh, page for those summer institutes. A great opportunity for you to come in. Uh, some of our institutes offer you some hands-on training uh, in dealing with uh, how EMAT operates, uh, a chance really just to network with colleagues who are doing the same thing uh, that you are, and we really hope that by the time that some of these institutes happen that maybe there will be some more definitive answers as far as uh, your funding. Uh, we'll hope that maybe the, uh, the legislature can get that, their act together and, and move a little quicker than we even hope and, and we'll have some good answers for you at that point at those uh, summer institutes. But please take an opportunity to, uh, to go uh, to one of those, especially if you are aware of or you are a new coordinator who just needs some support and help in understanding how this whole uh, kind of complex system now of dealing with instructional materials works. Uh, that's what this organization is committed to, is to giving you information that you need to help do your job to the best of your ability. So we encourage you to be part of that. As well uh, as that reminder, I also want to remind you that our annual conference will be here before we know it. Even though we're just getting into summer, uh, we'll be uh, getting things prepared and ready for that happening in December. So the first week in December there, December 3rd through 6th in San Marcos, uh, Texas at uh, the uh, Embassy Suites um, Conference Center there. You want to make arrangements to be a part of that and absolutely get some of the most up-to-date information that you can get as far as what's going on with some of the legislative fallout that's happened uh, you know, through the summer and ways that you can uh, best prepare for upcoming events that are going to happen because all of us that are involved in the instructional materials world know that uh, we're coming up with some big adoptions here in 2019 and 2020 that we need to prepare for and so uh, we want to be all the help that we can be so that conference in December is something you want to put on your calendar and make sure uh, to be a part of that so that you can get the most up-to-date and current information on what's going on with all things instructional materials. Uh, so if you need more information once again go to imcat.org uh, keep checking the imcat newsletters both print and electronic and our website uh, for information about future webcasts and other training opportunities. Uh, I want to check, make one other check here and see if we have any questions. I, I don't have any particular questions that have come in. Apparently, Colby, you have wowed them or lulled them to sleep, That's one of the two, the, probably the latter. Uh, with all of the uh, information that you've shared today. But we want to thank you for your time uh, today, and we also want to thank you for your time, Colby, that you spend each and every day in Austin during the circus that is uh, this legislative time. And we know that uh, you're not just strictly working for IMCAT, that you have other uh, folks that you're working for as well. But we appreciate the time and effort and the detail that you go into with you and, and, and your firm as y'all uh, work on our behalf to try to make things better uh, for students and, and schools here in Texas. And so we just want to publicly say thanks so much for your hard work. Thank you, Tony. And there's there's no more uh, important client than IMCAT to me uh, because IMCAT kind of gave me my start in this world, right? Um, and so my priority during session when it comes to the instructional material allotment and the budget, always IMCAT is first because um, the IMA is your lifeline right. and I think it's unfortunate that we're seeing you know cuts mm -hmm. uh, because I think for the future that's that's definitely going to impact our organization right absolutely uh, keep your eyes and ears posted for uh, information concerning uh, how the legislature is going to move uh, as the session ends and, and then most likely goes into special session and we'll uh, we'll be getting information out to you from uh, the IMCAT organization to let you know what's going on. Just hang on there. We know that you're anxious about wanting to know how much money is going to be uh, in your IMA uh, account there and, and ready to get into EMAT and doing some ordering, but we'll have to be patient at this point in time and wait for all of the processes that just have to happen uh, to take place. And so... Um, and Tony, just, one, one thing on that, yep. uh, sorry to interrupt, no. but... Uh, do you remember that the front-loading bill passed? Correct. Uh, and so that will be happening again. You'll have the majority of your funds September 1. Okay. Um, we do, obviously, we don't know what the commissioner will do with uh, the high growth sort of allotment that he keeps back uh, for districts that experience that fast growth. Um, 
but we do know that we're going to be getting more money than right. we got last session, even though with the cuts. Right. Um, and so, you know, what I will tell you is obviously we got to wait for the budget to come out, but do know that there is um, light at the end of that tunnel. That's good. Thank, thanks for that reminder. So, so do know that uh, it all is not lost, and so it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be great, and we're going to be able to, uh, to go through and have a great uh, school year for the 2017-18 school year. And uh, we're just thankful that we have someone in our corner here in Austin that's uh, continuing to uh, let people know uh, what's happening. Uh, I do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, will the webcast be placed on the IMCAT website? Absolutely. It's being recorded, and so that's going to be a uh, available uh, later uh, today so that you can go back and refer to that. And I have a magic question coming in from the side here as well. Uh, what is it that we as coordinators can do? Who should we contact, write letters, or email to uh, as we finish, finish up today? We'll be. Right. Um, so in terms of specific issues or, or even general issues, you know, letting people know um, what you do for a living, uh, a lot of this job, as I've told you in the past, Tony, is, is education, right? right. Um, you guys deal with IMA all the time, uh, but some of these uh, legislators have never even heard of the IMA. Right. Uh, and so one of the things I think that you can obviously do is reach out to your representative and your senator and say, hey, I want to serve as a resource. Um, to let me know. Right. And so that's, um, that's my best advice. There's nothing really specifically out there right now um, mm -hmm. that, that we, can, we can do. Obviously, if you have someone that's a budget conferee on the conference committee, uh, you can obviously call them and tell them that you're dissatisfied with the cuts and the precedent that's setting. Right. Okay. All right. Great. And I would just say case in point, I can give you an example from my own experience that uh, there was a call and a question to have some people give uh, one of the representatives who was considering passing a bill which would have impacted IMA uh, or, or the, the instructional materials world uh, during this session. And I just made a simple phone call uh, to that representative based on that contact and had a conversation. And just my conversation with them, just from my perspective as an instructional materials coordinator, change their position on that and they ended up not following through with that because it really would have wasted uh, a lot of people's time including theirs and so I think that proves the fact that you you can be heard if you'll if you'll take just the initiative maybe to make a phone call uh, make some contact and especially if someone reaches out to you and say hey someone wants some information wants to hear from those who are in that world uh, then don't don't wait and think that somebody else needs to do that if there's a, a call to for, for us to make contact, let's do that as an organization and, and let those, uh, those things be heard and don't, don't think that your voice is not important. Um, check back with our, um, our the IMCAT.org website today so that you can see a recording of this, share this with folks that may have not been able to see it live. Once again, remind you about the uh, opportunities for Summer Institute this summer, the opportunity for the conference in December, uh, make yourself available uh, to those things. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks again, Colby, for, for doing that. Cliff and everyone here at uh, the IMCAT uh, headquarters here in Pflugerville. And with that, we'll say have a great uh, Friday, a great weekend, and uh, thanks for joining us today.